FPA, the World Affairs Council, WAC, the Business Advisory Council, BAC, the notorious ABA, Americans for Democratic Action, virtually headed by Walter Luther, the notorious 1313 in Chicago. Barry Goldwater was, and no doubt still is, a vice president of one of the CFR subsidiaries. In addition, the CFR set up special committees in every state in the Union to whom they assigned the various local state operations. Simultaneously, the Rothschilds set up similar CFR-like control groups in England, France, Germany, and other nations to control world conditions and cooperate with CFR to bring about another world war. But the CFR's first and foremost job was to get complete control of our mass communications media. The control of the press was assigned to Rockefeller. Thus, Henry Luce, who recently died, was financed to set up a number of national magazines, among them Life, Time, Fortune, and others, which publish USSR in America. The Rockefellers also directly or indirectly financed the Cowles Brothers Look magazine and a chain of newspapers. They also financed a man named Sam Newhouse to buy up and build a chain of newspapers all over the country. And the late Eugene Meyer, one of the founders of CFR, bought the Washington Post, Newsweek, the Weekly Magazine, and other publications. At the same time, CFR began to develop and nurture a new breed of scurrilous columnists and editorial writers, such as Walter Lippmann, Drew Pearson, the Alsops, Herbert Matthews, Irwin Cannon, and others of that ilk, who called themselves liberals, who proclaimed that Americanism is isolationism, that isolationism is warmongerism, that anti-communism is anti-Semitism and racism. All that took time, of course, but today our entire press, except for some local small-town papers and weeklies published by patriotic organizations, is completely controlled by CFR stooges, and thus they finally succeeded in breaking us up into a nation of quarreling, wrangling, squabbling, hating factions. Now, if you still wonder about the splanted news an outright lie you read in your paper, you have the answer. To the Laymans, Goldman Sachs, Kuhn Loeb, and the Warburgs, the CFR assigned the job of getting control of the motion picture industry, Hollywood, radio and television, and believe you me, they succeeded. If you still wonder about the strange propaganda broadcast by the Ed Murrows, Chet Huntley, Howard K. Smith, Eric Severide, Drew Pearson, and others of that ilk, you have the answer. If you wonder about all the smut, sex, pornography, and mixed marriage films you see in your movie theater and on your TV set, all of which is demoralizing our youth, you have the answer. The whole story of the CFR conspiracy takeover of our mass communications media is far too long to include in this recording, but you can find it in the news bulletin number 125, entitled How to Get the Reds Out of Communications Media. It was published and brought up to date by the Cinema Educational Guild. It tells in detail how the press, the movies, TV and radio have been, and still are, used to brainwash the people, to demoralize our youth, and they have been and still are encouraging and creating sympathy for the rioting Negro civil rights lawlessness. You can get a copy of this news bulletin by writing to the Cinema Educational Guild, Post Office Box 46205, Hollywood, California. Now to refresh your memory, let's go back for a moment. Wilson's flop had torpedoed all chances of transforming that League of Nations into the conspirators hoped for one world government housing. So the Jacob Schiff flop had to be done all over again. And they organized the CFR to do it. We also know how successfully the CFR did that job of brainwashing and destroying the unity of the American people. But as was the case with the shift plot, the climax and the creation of a new housing for their one world government required another world war, 
A war that would be even more horrible and more devastating than the First World War. In order to get the people of the world to again clamor for peace and a means to end all wars. But the CFR realized that the aftermath of World War II would have to be more carefully planned so that there would be no escape from the new one world trap, another League of Nations, that would emerge from the new war, the trap we now know as the United Nations. And they hit upon a perfect strategy to ensure that no escape. Here's how they did it. In 1943, in the midst of the war, they prepared the framework for the United Nations, and it was handed over to Roosevelt and our State Department to be given birth by Alger Hiss, Pazwalski, Dalton Trumbo, and other American traitors, thus making the whole scheme a United States baby. Then to fix our parenthood, New York City was to become the nursery for the monstrosity. After that, we could hardly walk out on our own baby, now could we? Anyway, that's how the conspirators figured it would work, and so far it has. And the liberal Rockefeller donated the land for the United Nations building. The United Nations Charter was written by Alger Hiss, Pazwalski, Dalton Trumbo, and other CFR stooges. A phony so-called UN conference was set up in San Francisco in 1945. All the so-called representatives of 50-odd nations gathered there, promptly signed the charter. And the despicable traitor, Alger Hiss, flew to Washington with it, elatedly submitted it to our Senate, and the Senate, elected by our people to safeguard our security, signed the charter without so much as reading it. The question is, how many of our senators were even then traitorous stooges of the CFR? Anyway, it was thus that the people accepted the United Nations as a holy of holies and enabled traitor Earl Warren to virtually destroy our Constitution by basing all his traitorous decisions on the UN Charter, thus making that Charter virtually our law of the land. However, for all the dirty work that had to be done to solidify the UN, the new housing of the One World Plot, they still required the aid of our leaders in Washington. So now I will emphasize the fiendish cleverness of the CFR masterminds. To the vast majority of the American people, our foreign policy for many years has been a complete enigma. Most of us simply can't understand why this great nation is seemingly floundering so helplessly in the art of diplomacy. We can't understand why our leaders are seemingly so confused and bewildered in all their dealings with Moscow, France, and other nations, and with the UN. We always hear them proclaiming that in view of our overwhelming economic and military superiority, we must always lead from strength. Yet, at all the summit meetings and conferences, they cringe and stammer and stutter, and, so to speak, come out with their tails between their hind legs. We can't understand the foreign aid to Tito, an avowed enemy, to Poland, an avowed enemy, to all the avowed communist nations. We can't understand why the expenditure of hundreds of billions of dollars has failed to slow down, let alone stop, the march of communism. We are perplexed by the seeming ineptness of the State Department, the Defense Department, the CIA, the USIA, of all our federal agencies. Again and again and again we have been startled, shocked, bewildered, and horrified by their mistakes in Berlin, in Korea, in Laos, in Katanga, in Cuba, in Vietnam. Mistakes that always favor the enemy, never the United States. Under the law of averages, they should have made at least one, one or two mistakes in our favor, but they never did. What's the answer? The answer is the CFR and the parts played by their subsidiaries and stooges in Washington. Thus we know that complete control of our foreign relations policy is the key to the success of the entire Illuminati One World Plot. Here's the further proof. 
Earlier, I fully established that Chip and his gang had financed the Lenin...